Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guest is Anthony Freud, General Director, President, and CEO of Lyric Opera of Chicago. Thank you, Anthony, for joining us, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions to the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. Anthony, it's so good to see you again. And Likewise, Lyric Opera uh, is, is keeping you very busy, even during this crazy coronavirus lockdown time, isn't it? You know, I think um, we've never been busier. Um, it's something that my colleagues and I talk about all the time, that over the last now just over 10 weeks since we've been working remotely and dealing with the fallout from um, all the actions we've had to take um, following the COVID-19 pandemic, I, I don't think we have ever been busier. And, and the reason for that is that you are not frozen in time. You are shifting your schedule in order to accommodate public health concerns. You're, you're ensuring that your musicians, your staff, um, the, the wonderful um, uh, performers are all protected but you're shifting, not stopping, aren't you? We're constantly shifting because we're caught in a vacuum of total uncertainty. And I, I think one of the things that I personally find hardest to deal with is um, really managing that uncertainty because we're all programmed in our own ways to fix issues, to solve problems. Um, but at the moment it's impossible, and I think that is the right word, um, to, even to form an informed instinct about what is likely to happen next, um, let alone informed judgments. Um, and all we can do, I think, is use the time during this uncertainty as best we can to position ourselves so that when a recovery begins and a new normal begins to emerge, uh, we're absolutely ready to rise to its challenges and opportunities. Um, but in fact, over the last 10 weeks or so, we have spent most of our time dealing with the fallout from the various cancellations and staffing changes and discussions with unions um, that inevitably stem from the actions that we've had to take. How is the health of your, uh, of your people, your staff, your performers, your board members, musicians, um, and, and, and how, how are people um, working together, coming together, is, is, are, are you finding that attitudes are shifting, that, that otherwise uh, contentious relationships might be viewed with a little bit more understanding, or is the stress taking its toll and are people becoming less tolerant of each other? Well, the health and well-being of our staff, our artists, um, our audiences, our public, um, is of course our absolute number one priority. And, and that really has driven all the decisions that we have been taking um, since the first one. And the first one, first critical decision, um, and I'll never forget the date, Friday, March 13th, was the date that I um, gathered together all the artists, technical staff, um, uh, backstage staff um, involved in our brand new production of Wagner's Ring. Um, and those of you who don't know the operatic repertoire, um, it, it is the largest undertaking any opera company can conceive. It's the we, Ever, Everest of the opera world. It is, and we were um, two thirds, if not three quarters of the way through rehearsals um, for a brand new production um, that Lyric was, was originating of Wagner's Ring. And um, it, it really was the perfect storm in that there could not have been a more damaging event for us to cancel. But um, it was clear given the um, announcements in the days leading up to March 13th from both our governor and our mayor that we really had no option but um, to cancel and to cancel with immediate effect. And so we lost our new production of Götterdämmerung, which was the fourth of the four giant music dramas that make up Wagner's Ring and all three cycles. Um, and of course, immediately we were plunged into an existential crisis. And immediately after announcing the cancellation to the hundreds of people who'd gathered on stage, and it's a very, very large group of, of um, singers, um, orchestral musicians, uh, stage crew, 
um, and various backstage departments and production team, um, I asked to meet with our union colleagues um, uh, and I met with the representatives of our three biggest unions and I, I said, this truly is an existential crisis and we need to work through this together. And so we had four or five days of um, very collaborative um, discussion uh, and we reached an agreement and, and it's thanks to that collaboration and I'm very grateful to our union colleagues for that collaboration. Uh, I think we reached a conclusion that, that ensured that there was um, e equity um, for all those directly affected by that decision. Um, but of course, the financial impact, uh, as well as the heartbreaking emotional loss of the ring, the financial impact was also um, devastating. We, we calculated a worst case scenario. Um, and by that, I mean a scenario in which we would have to meet all our expenses and generate none of our income of $27.5 million dollars from the cancellation of the ring and all the other subsequent activities um, of the season. We have managed that down to now a projected loss on the year of just over $13.5 million. Uh, clearly better than the worst case scenario, but still an eye-watering sum of money. Um, the way we did that was through the discussions we had with our unions, um, through the generosity of our production sponsors, and uh, we've created what we call a Heroes Fund um, that was started by our board chair-elect, Sylvia Neal, who, with her husband, Dan Fischel, became sponsors of the ring after it was cancelled. Um, and all our ring production sponsors and all our 42nd Street production sponsors, and 42nd Street was to have been our musical that would have opened any day now, actually. Um, all our production sponsors agreed to um, allow us to use their production sponsorships to help us relieve the immediate crisis. It's, it's so interesting. You have on your board people who connect to business interests throughout the state and throughout the country and throughout the world, actually. You have uh, interests of, of union members uh, who are um, thinking about uh, their members, the, the, the unions are thinking about their members, and it's a smaller interest group just as the uh, board members represent a smaller interest group. So you have, you have performers, you have stagehands, you have uh, all the staff, all the infrastructure. So people are coming together and donors as well who are investing in you they're coming together and they're, they're taking a hit. Everybody is taking a hit. And, and they're doing it not necessarily out of total gener generosity for the other, although that is, is also there. It comes out of a recognition that together we need to, we need to uh, ensure that this arch form remains vital. Generosity for the other, I think, is a very important part of what has been driving all this, both union members who wanted to ensure that, that, that their colleagues were dealt with fairly, to donors who have come up with, in some cases, new money, um, substantial new money, in order to alleviate our um, immediate uh, financial issues, along with ticket holders who have chosen to donate back the value of their tickets to the company, along very regrettably with the number of, of sacrifices that our staff have had to make because we've imposed um, salary cuts to our higher paid members of staff um, and we've instituted furloughs and hour reductions. So re really it is, it is a, a, an extraordinary level of generosity and realism that I think has driven the actions so far. And everybody collaborating together is helping you to plan for the future. So talk about uh, a bit about those future plans and how you are retaining your core and, and ensuring that, that people are pressing toward a goal so that we can start that reopening process and ensure that, that audiences, performers, can interact, that your people are supporting a really vital arts institution. Well, I mentioned earlier that, that I think we're caught at the moment in a vacuum of uncertainty, which with really no indication as to when that uncertainty will end. We're surrounded by 
swirling clouds of information, some of which right. is contradictory, all of which is, is confusing, frankly, in terms of allowing us to reach decisions. But absolutely, we are focusing at the moment, uh, and this is a very proactive, very dynamic process of scenario modeling. Um, we, we can't predict the future. I think it's frankly a wasted energy to try and decide whether to be optimistic or pessimistic in the near term or the long term. So what we're doing, both as an internal process and as an outside in process, is um, scenario modeling, understanding the range of scenarios that could confront us and understanding what Lyric's role within each of those scenarios might be. Uh, and clearly, the new normal when it, arise, when it arrives will be fundamentally different, in my opinion, from the old normal. How it will differ and when it will arrive remains to be seen. But, but our priority is to ensure that when it does arrive, we are truly fit for purpose and we'll be positioned so as to be able to rise to both its challenges and opportunities. Um, navigating the extraordinarily turbulent waters um, that we have had to um, journey through for the last 10 weeks and that we will continue to have to journey through for who knows how long um, it is, of course, the um, immediate challenge. People are beginning to talk about socially distanced outdoor concerts. Uh, they're beginning to talk about the, the, um, the rules for uh, indoor concerts. But as you said, there, there's, there's very little ability to determine exactly when a hall will open. So in terms of, of uh, maintaining the connection with your audiences, are you using um, uh, more diverse means, as I, as I referred to, um, or are you considering more diverse means, as I referred to the outdoor concerts or uh, electronically mediated um, uh, interactions through these devices. Um, what, what, what kind of discussions are you holding internally? Well, the, there's a stay-at-home order in Illinois still in force, so outdoor concerts are not yet a possibility. Um, but certainly our focus is on um, comprehensive, regular, and hopefully effective communication with all our stakeholders be they our audiences, be they our board members, um, be they members of, uh, of the company, members of our, our staff. Um, and certainly what we're doing is trying to ensure that we keep Lyric and Opera in the hearts and minds uh, of our stakeholders. So for example, um, twice a week, we're sending out what I would describe as an entertainment email with excerpts from uh, productions with links to what we think of as, as, as notable opportunities to experience virtual opera. Um, we have family interactions. So one of the events we've postponed was our annual family day. Um, and so um, we're ensuring that people who were going to come um, to family day have through our emails and, and through our website opportunities to engage and energize children, grandchildren um, in what we do and in, in the art form of opera. So yes, absolutely, Mark. I, I do think virtual um, communication is uh, extraordinarily important. Um, I, I think as we move towards the new normal, we're going to have to get better, more adventurous, more radical in using virtual communication, frankly, as an art form in itself, rather than just as a means of communicating conventionally performed art. Um, you, I, you had mentioned beforehand, before the, the, the show started, uh, this idea of creating art that really can only be performed within the, the, the virtual environment. Talk a little bit about, about that idea of extending the art using technology and modernizing the art, but, but retaining that core of performance. Well, to me, um, the live experience is irreplaceable. And I refuse to believe that we um, will never regain our appetite for social interaction, for gathering together in large groups to experience the transformational power of live music and live opera. I believe that will come. It probably will take effective management of COVID-19 to generate the 
um, confidence that large groups of people will need um, to gather again um, uh, in these large groups to experience um, live music making and live opera. But in the meantime, I do think that um, virtual art, um, which has become so important in the last two or three months, is going to be here to stay, not to replace the live experience, but to supplement the live experience. And some of it will indeed relate to um, deepening people's experience when they get to a theater or a concert hall or an opera house. But I do believe that the virtual experience has the capacity to generate art in itself so that um, we, through our computers, through our phones, etc., cetera, um, will experience not just um, the communication of something that could just as easily be performed live, but in time, I think we will all be working to develop works of art that are only um, possible to exist virtually. And I think that could be very exciting. Uh, and I think it could, complement, but as I say, never ultimately replace the live experience. One of the things that, that I really love in working with you and in, in, in having uh, served Lyric Opera in the past is to sit down with, with you and talk about these kinds of topics, right? And, and your artists who have a totally different perspective. Um, the, the people who have lived and breathed um, opera uh, yet found a role for themselves in administration, whether it's in finance or one of the other departments, how people see about marketing and connecting young audiences to this to this art form. The the thing that I that that I think is is the real opportunity is that you have people and personalities who put these shows together and they care so much. And it, it's it's just wonderful to be able to, in this small way, reveal some of your thinking, this idea of creating art for the virtual realm um, that young people can connect to, that complements uh, the, the live performance. It's, it's tremendously innovative. Yeah, I, I mean, we always have to remember that we are living through and experiencing a national and global catastrophe and tragedy. Um, and at the same time, uh, we're going through an extraordinarily intense learning experience trying to understand new ideas, new opportunities, new ways of centralizing art and culture at the heart of, of our lives and why we exist. Um, and I'm on one level profoundly optimistic that the role of culture, the role of the arts uh, will continue to be as important and as ever, if not more important as we move through this traumatic time to a new normal. I, I, I couldn't agree more. We have a question about monetizing these interactions because of course, in order to retain the, um, the standard, um, people do need to make a living in doing it. If they don't, then, that, then it becomes a, a matter of, of volunteerism, uh, but it's very difficult to dedicate oneself to excellence um, if one is not getting paid for, for that excellence. How are you thinking in terms of monetizing those interactions that may not be about a standard ticket transaction in order to experience one of these performances? Well, it's, it's a great question. And uh, certainly I, I wouldn't imagine that we would ask the creators of um, virtual art to um, give us their talents for nothing and, and clearly paying those creators whatever would be an appropriate rate in this new world will be um, of critical importance. Having said that, monetizing the result, I think is a far harder question. And I'm not aware even of one example anywhere in the world of classical music um, existing virtually in a way that um, has proved cost efficient uh, uh, and even that has covered its own costs. So much richness is available to all of us virtually for nothing that it's from today's perspective, I have to say, hard to imagine how um, virtual art can be monetized 
by those communicating it. But that, as I say, is different from my expectation that those creating it would, of course, need to be paid. We also have a question from Andrew Barnes about the whole idea of the, the sense of occasion and the fact that, that these venues also function as social uh, spaces of, of bringing people together, which of course is very difficult in a socially distanced way. Are you thinking about the community aspects of the, uh, of the online uh, operatic world in terms of uh, bringing people together, people who might be willing to financially support the, the art form or people who are composing uh, new works. How are you thinking in, in, in those terms and about lyric? You know, lyric is a center of excellence. It's a center of, of exposition, of performance, but of course that excellence is drawn internationally. How do you think of lyric as, a, as the connective tissue in the opera world? Well, over the last two or three months, we have um, explored and pursued ways of communicating virtually um, that we have never done before. Um, from this webinar all the way through to a range of larger and small scale group meetings. And we found our board meetings um, when they exist virtually are extraordinarily well attended. And although are very different in nature from everyone gathering together in a room, they are still functional. Um, and Lyric, uh, as an organization, has been working remotely for, for more than 10 weeks now. Um, and it's working fine from a functional point of view. Having said all that, um, and embracing as we move ahead, the lessons that we're learning about the effectiveness of virtual communication, I, I do think ultimately we're all developing a, a real hunger to gather again in person, to look at each other across a table, to share an experience in an opera house or in a theater that is ultimately the essence of our art. Um, and as I said earlier, I, I do believe that that new normal when it arrives, and it probably will take um, the medical profession's ability to manage COVID-19, but when it arrives, I do think we will be keener than ever to gather together um, for social interaction and to enjoy again the special experience of 3,000 people um, in an opera house, um, enjoying and participating in a great performance um, as something that I personally am increasingly um, hungry to recover. Anthony, your artists, in a sense, are also team athletes, right? They're individual athletes, either vocal athletes or uh, in terms of, of, uh, of their various uh, instruments. Um, they need to remain in practice. And it is also very difficult to receive vocal training when the, the, what, what is heard by the two parties or, or more parties is, is electronically mediated. And of course, the sound is not going to be the same. Um, how are people beginning to cope? We've, we've seen uh, people cluster up and try to create protected groups where they can uh, practice together. Are, are those types of activities um, undertaken in terms of, of keeping your artists uh, working together uh, and, and rehearsing together as part of a team? Or have you just kind of settled down and you're, you're just now thinking of those issues? Well, for the moment, those sort of groupings would not be legal because we are, as I say, still under a stay at home order. But, but I have to say that in terms of vocal training, our Ryan Opera Center is operating at full swing. And the new ensemble started a couple of weeks ago, and there's extensive both uh, coaching and vocal training um, being um, conducted virtually um, with uh, the music director of the Rhine Opera Center, Craig Terry at his home, Julia Faulkner, our director of vocal studies at her home, uh, and the members of the Rhine Opera Center in their homes communicating directly on singing lessons and on coachings. So no, it's not as satisfactory as being together in a room, but as with everything else, this is not a moment to furrow our brows, gaze at our navels and worry. This is a moment to be inventive, proactive, dynamic and radical in our thinking and energized in our approach to dealing with this crisis. 
where do the ideas come from as you as you are trying to think out of the box? You know, we all build ourselves little boxes that work. And when things change so radically, right, those little boxes that we have spent entire careers building become traps, right? So you kind of have to break your own box and, and, and move on. How do you elicit the kind of creativity through your, um, through all the members of your staff in order to break your own boxes, reinvent under very difficult circumstances where everybody's taking pay cuts, their hours are reduced. How does that function? Well, as we all know, there's no exclusivity to good ideas. And the more brainstorming we can do, the, the higher the chance of really great ideas emerging. Um, and so we are gathering virtually um, uh, very regularly. I have to say in terms of frequency, our, our communication throughout the company um, has probably improved as a result of our virtual existence. But, but it isn't just limited to Lyric. Um, I, I'm in very, very regular touch with my colleagues uh, around the country, um, uh, around the world. Um, Opera America has done an extraordinarily effective job in gathering groups of us um, many times a week in order to brainstorm, in order to share experiences, in order to learn um, lessons from one another. Uh, because although um, different companies of different sizes are affected by this crisis in different ways, we're all in this together and we're all having to grapple with our challenges. Um, and I think the words unique and unprecedented are overused, but I think on this occasion, they are actually the right words to be used. Um, and so working together, communicating really thoroughly and thoroughly and regularly um, it is a way in which we can share good ideas um, and learn from uh, the experiences of others. That kind of shared sacrifice and the ability, the willingness to sacrifice amongst all of your people, all of the unions, all of your management, all of the artists, the donors, your audiences, that idea that doing things differently, taking a risk in a risky time is so important, the flexibility that you've exhibited, the connectivity that you have so that ideas can be rapidly share, shared. Anthony Floyd, thank you so much for sharing the work of, of Lyric Opera Chicago, the art that you have, the art of keeping an arts organization going. And, and, and thank you also for continuing to drive toward the reopening. We all need opera. We all need these art forms. Um, so you have uh, full support from everybody. Thank you very much. That's the nonprofit report for this week. And thank you all attendees for coming. We'll try to get other questions answered offline.